very soon, in two years or less. But the other problem with the Airbus that remained open until two years ago was, in this case, two is the smallest model line. The question, can you cook one, something with three is the smallest model line. And then can you cook one with, with five, and there was a spot. And somebody in the University of Illinois in the 1971, uh, called Cook, uh, Cook and I think, had the record up to 20. And they used the computers, people got it more and more and more. And uh, so the latest record uh, until uh, two years ago, I think was the, the smallest borderline was, I don't know, 50, I don't know exactly. But it was fairly large. So city was just like, and you needed more and more computers. The, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But please, but elders thought, uh, believed that it's always possible to go arbitrarily large. So elders believed that uh, you can have one uh, such a system with many, 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 many whose smallest is a billion or a zillion. Of course, the number of sequences would be, have to be very, very large, but you always go. This is for an exact covering system? No, no, this is for the joint. This joint? Yeah, no, exact, no, for the joint. That's for the joint. Exact is for the figure. Yeah, everything is by the joint. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, the joint. No, thank you. Uh, for no, no, for the, for the state. For the state. For this thing, all the more like the thing. The more like this thing, yeah. All the more like yeah. There was a big open problem of Ernest, very, very famous open problem. And then Bob, uh, young unfortunately, <laughs> and brilliant, recent uh, uh, PhD, now he's in Sony, uh, now he's in his Sony book. But he got his PhD from Stanford and he spent some time in Cambridge. <coughs> uh, and this work was done in Cambridge. Proved the conjecture was wrong. And in hindsight, uh, I am the same on elders. In the benefit of hindsight, it was a stupid conjecture he made. Uh, <laughs> it seemed that it was very unreasonable to expect. And now, uh, this proof is fairly complicated. I don't have time or energy to do it. But I give you a heuristic version of this why it's not possible. And he proved that the smallest model line has to be, I think, a hundred million. So if there is, and if the smallest model line is more than a hundred million, there's no way you can do it. A distinct uh, coverage system. And probably this is uh, unrealistic. Probably 200 is probably the real thing. But nobody knows yet. So this was a uh, breakthrough. But now let me go back in time to the early 1980s. Also, I get credit for this discovery. So a whole new approach to covering systems that prove many things, not as famous as this one, but lots of other open problems, not so dramatic, but still with a beautiful approach. It's due to Berger, Mark Berger, Alex Felsenbaum, and at the end, the Frankel, my good friend at the end, Frankel, who recently celebrated his 88th birthday and is still publishing, go to his website, very active. So that makes sense. Another example, the mathematics is an old man's day. day. So in 19, but my name is not here. But without it, this would never come to be. What happened at the time in 1982, I was a young faculty uh, assistant professor, or it was called senior lecturer, at the Weizmann Institute of Science. That's where I got my PhD uh, a few years before. And my advisor, Harry Dim, my beloved academic father, at the time happened to be the chair of the department. And then somebody I met, Mark Gardner, I met in one of my postdocs at Georgia Tech. He wanted to move to Israel, and he was looking for a job. So it turns out that Mark Berger proved a conjecture of Harry Dim a few years before. And Harry Dim was so impressed, he hired him on the spot. So without me introducing Berger to my advisor, Harry Dim, Berger would never get a job in Israel. <laughs> and Berger, Mark Berger, is a good mathematician, but he's also an observant Jew. He goes to synagogue every day. 
and that doesn't get excited. And so it appears to be Franklin. Yes. So the man in the synagogue and they started talking. And what Doug did is he's very, very over the head of Franklin. They did very fancy stuff with Ito Castellos. But Franklin did it very smart, but then the man did it like I do and stuff. So it was easier for Berger to work with Franklin's stuff and vice versa. So Franklin started to talk to him about the problem. Then some a little bit eccentric new Russian emigre called Alex Tesselbaum applied to the graduate program at Weizmann Institute. And I was on the committee to decide whether. So his record was not stellar, it was mixed. So it was a borderline case. And I convinced them to accept him. And he had the basic idea, and then the collaboration, it was thanks to me, got to at least 20 papers. And this ingrate we never mentioned, <laughs> is the most time for introducing us to So now I'm correcting this uh, in public, this uh, omission. It was not intentional. They didn't know you know it. Anyway, what was the idea? Go back to China. The Chinese remain their theorem. That was a brilliant idea. So reminding you, if you have, for example, any integer between 0 and 104, you can take it mod 2, mod 2, mod, yeah, mod, mod 3, no, uh, 2, yeah, mod 2 and 10. You can take it from 2 and 10 is 2 times 3 times 5 times 7. So you do the mapping. X with a uh, 209. All the integers from 0 to 9. X goes to the remainder when you take it by 2. So this is the Chinese remainder theorem mapping. X mod 5, X mod 7. For example, let's do one example. Is it, uh, let's do one uh, So example, if X is 11. Apply this mapping. Um, uh, Mizia, uh, what is it? Uh, one. Comma? Uh, three. Comma? One. Four. Very good. So this is a mapping of all the integers from 0 to 2009 to the box. Three. One, two, one, four. No, no that's not three. three. Oh, the second one. Oh, this two. Oh yeah, yeah, 11, more 3 is 2, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so this is really the cube. So the mapping from the interval from 0 to the cube. 0 to 1, Cartesian product with 0 to 2, Cartesian product 0 to 4, Cartesian product to 0 to 6. So it's like a four-dimensional room whose dimension are two by three by five by seven. So every point gets mapped, every integer from zero to 209 gets mapped. By the way, even though the original vision of covering systems is about all integers, it's really a finite problem. Without the generality, it's enough to go to the least common multiple of all the modulation. So you take, it's a least common multiple of all the modulars, M1, M capital N, let's call it, I don't know, capital, let's call it A. Then of course, by repetition, it's enough to check it up to this. So it's really a final problem. Partition all the integers from 0 to M minus 1 into covering 6. So a point, uh, so a single integer corresponds to a point. A zero dimensional six. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, hey, 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 sorry, you don't come here usually. So you don't know the rules. There's it absolutely no, it's much more about it. Sorry, you're welcome to leave any time, but you're not supposed to use it. Sorry. No, it's my fault. Anyway, so what about the congruence, for example, uh, uh, the uh, zero motor? This exactly, so this is a, let's call it x1, 
comma, so rather x2, comma x3, comma x5, then comma x5. So let's call this the uh, numbers here. So zero, one, two, is that the subbox, the three dimensional things. And so, uh, let's do another example. Uh, one mod six. So once again, you use the mapping and get one mod six, is really, but for this remainder, is the, the easy part. One mod two, and zero mod three. So this corresponds to x2 equals one, and x3 equals zero. So it's really, breaking a box, in this case, four-dimensional box, into sub-boxes, including zero-dimensional boxes. So all it is, and this was very fruitful insight. In hindsight, it's not hard, but it's really fruitful. And using this, they were able to get a new, completely correct proof of the previous theorem, that when you have exact, basically, if you have a way of partitioning a big box into smaller box, let's take a corner, a two by two by two by two six, and have the partition that is induced by this. But then in the partition induced by this, you have a cube, two by two by two, and a mesa cube. And obviously, in the cube, every subcube has a power of two, except for the zero dimensional cube. So if there's one dim zero dimensional cube, this one point, there must be another point. So this is basically the proof, a beautiful proof with uh, using. But because of this, it was basically, so number theory was only a red herring. There's another example where primes are red herring. So the problem can make sense in general. So it's nothing to do with primes, and nothing is that a special case. But the box has dimensions that are primes. By the way, for the sake of simplicity, I'm doing square free. Uh, it's slightly more complicated to do it non square free, but the same arguments work. So you can consider the general problem. You have a k dimensional box of this dimension, uh, this size. C1, oh, okay, C1 is so, so C1 by C2 box. Can you break it up into subboxes in lower dimensional ones, including singletons? So, if you specialize for C1 equals 2 or the C is to be 2, you have the unit cube, breaking the unit cube into subcubes. That's exactly our old friend, DNF. And the same questions that Erdos asked could be asked in this context. Forget about covering systems. So you have, so DNF, for example, here's an example of a DNF in one variable. And there's another example. So it's interesting to find distinct DNFs. So the analog of the Erdos problem, can you find distinct DNF? So in this case, uh, so it's not, so sorry, it's not, it has to be topology. It has to cover everything. So it's distinct from what we're interested in and what I believe uh, by the program to find distinct DNF topology. That, I mean, so that's the exact Boolean analog of the famous Erdos problem. So in this case, and so x1, yeah, x2, x, yeah. So this is an example of two elements. So x1, or not x1 and x2, or not x1 and not x2. So it's exact, the normal overlap, because this, this, and this, but uh, it's not this thing. We want the support to be different. So that's not a good example. But if you want this thing, it's easy to manufacture. x1, x2, x3. And is our, so no, so in this case, remember, all it's not like in English, in mathematics. So I'm smart, or I'm, I'm smart, or handsome, 
or strong or none of them. So this is example. And now they are distinct. Uh, X1, X2, X3. Uh, so this is not distinct because if you remove the bars, they are the same. But that's an example of a distinct. So the analog of the other thing doesn't exist, doesn't exist a distinct DNF pathology with arbitrary a large, a large uh, size of the monomial. And the answer for this Erdos was right. Because here is an example. For example, this five. The following is a distinct DNA pathology. X1, X2, X, or X1 and X3, the last of X4 or X5, or the uh, five choose two of them. Or not X1 and not X2 or not X3, the last or the 10 to 3, F5 to 3 of them. So that's an example. Everything is covered because every integer, uh, every vector of true and false uh, is of uh, uh, at most two, uh, two truths or at least uh, three false. And the same thing for arbitrary n. So we, we have 2n plus 1. You look all the 2n plus 1 to the n monomials with the positive and all the 2n plus 1 so the n plus 1, the same thing. With negation, it's easy to see. It's a tautology and it's distinct. And this can make a, as big as possible. So Erdos was right in the Buddha sense. Why was he right? Because 1 plus 1 half to the power of infinity minus 1 is infinity. Now, you can cook up an example where you have much bigger dimensions, and then it's obviously false. For example, 0, 2 by 0, 4 by 0, 8 by 0, 16. I don't have time to do it, but you can easily disqualify this. The reason is that the sum converges. Whenever it converges, Erdos is obviously wrong, triply wrong. Whenever it's constant, it's, it's obviously right. And the prime number, and this is not a red herring. Prime numbers are red herrings. If that happens to be n log n, and, and you know uh, the prime numbers. So in this case, it's borderline. It diverges, but barely so. So the big open problems that uh, uh, the big uh, class of problems that Anthony and I are doing, and everybody that's going on, is try to generalize it and find for what dimensions uh, it's still true, Erdos is right, Erdos is wrong. So maybe uh, n log log n or something, there are other things, there are even slow converging, uh, maybe it's right. Thank you very much. Here's Sloan giving talk about three beautiful problems in the OIH. Amen, thank you.